Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, your host for Navigating the Journey. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end of life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we can shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live at the end of our lives. It's time to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care unit. Together, we can explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make these difficult conversations easier. Together, we can make sure that our own wishes and those of our loved ones are expressed and respected. If you're ready to join us, we ask you, navigate the journey, explore the options and choices for the end of life. This is a conversation that every one of us needs to have, yet few are prepared for it in life. Too many people in our society have no idea how to properly help a loved one who is at the end of life. We don't know what to say, how to act, or what needs their loved ones have. Today's guest is my dear friend, Jade Young, hospice educator and chaplain. And Jade, ta -da, and I have been friends for 40 years, maybe? A long time. A long time. And I have known Jade from watching her for all these years of all of the, the real caring about people, about the environment, about the planet. And so she is a perfect person to be with us today to have a conversation about the end of life, the end of life choices, and all of the things that go with it that you have seen over the years. Now we started together in the Hunger Project? Hunger Project, even before that. Even before so that. We've worked on many projects. Many projects together. together. Yes. And for those of you that may see, wonder what all of this has to do, together with the Hunger Project, the caring for in the Old Testament, mm. in the New Testament, in the Quran, in the Book of Mormon, and any other book. It says that we should love our neighbors, mm -hmm. that we should care for the sick mm -hmm. and the dying. Mm -hmm. We should feed the hunger. As a society, we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. So it's people like Jade mm -hmm. that m remind us that this mm -hmm. needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And she is always doing caring for our neighbor. So, ta-da! <laughs> well, I want to say there are many of us out there who are, and I think have that, uh, desire to help and to alleviate the pain and suffering, you know. Yeah, so tell me now about your hospice educator. Now, what, what is a hospice educator? What okay. do you do exactly? Well, um, why I've added, even, while I'm basically a hospice chaplain, meaning we provide spiritual care and counseling and guidance, for a terminally ill patient and their families. Mm -hmm. It's important to include the families because once a person is diagnosed with something terminal and very serious, it affects everyone in their whole family system. Um, I have found in my own work over the years though, educating people about what hospice is as a service and what it is not is also very important to their sense of being at peace with the situation. Um, so I, I really want them to understand like what hospice can provide and that it's, while it includes the medical care of someone, it also includes far more than that. It's about the health of their relationships. It's about their emotional well-being and their spiritual well-being. So it's the total person that really becomes involved and that we want to look after. So is the family included in that? Yes, yes, very much so. So often when I would visit a patient for the first time, I would always call ahead and ask if some of the uh, significant family members can be there. If they couldn't because of work schedules or whatever, that was fine. But we really find that the more the family members are also informed and educated, 
and understand, they've really entered like a new landscape. And you know, if you're entering a new landscape or a new kind of country, let's say, where you may not know the geography, it really helps to have a guide or a little bit of a road map. It does. Um, and, and I've told this story before. One day, everything was fine in my life. And the next day, I'm a caregiver. Yeah. The next day, my mother, who we had for the last year of her life with hospice, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I had been a daughter for I'm all those years. Place. Now, my role, the role has changed. And honestly, it, it, it was... It was, well, it was a blessing in the long run, but at first I was like, now what do I do? Right. It can create a lot of confusion and chaos, and I would say, first of all, even a certain level of apprehension and yes. anxiety. Yes. Because you really don't know what's involved or what's expected of you and how to fulfill this new expectation. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to broaden that education so that that we're not talking about just the family of this particular loved one, but how can we broaden this conversation, which is what I want to do, broaden this conversation so that the public begins to see that the end of life is as sacred as the beginning. Yes, yes. How do we reach out? What do, well, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, I would say, Marcia, first of all, your show is one of the examples of how we can begin to broaden the reach and bring this topic out of the closet, I would say, so that more and more people can really engage with this, that it, it can become, I would say, even socially acceptable, you know, rather than a topic we shouldn't talk about. Right. Rather than it being taboo, which it still is for many places and ethnic groups where we don't want to talk about that. That's a no-no. Yeah. So I think this idea that, you know, we do so much to prepare and celebrate the birth of a child because it's a normal, natural thing, and there's the beauty of that. And I think we have, as a culture, been so taught that death and dying is a very fearful process rather than it's, it's actually a very natural process of life. It is. Uh, I don't know anyone who's not going to eventually <laughs> get, get there, there. Yes. to that part of the journey. You know, so no matter what your education or your station in life, you know, we will eventually encounter that. But we haven't seemed to um, include that as part of our overall, let, you know, this is part of what life is. Yes. We have, you know, birth, we have midlife, and then we also have end of life, right. which, as you said, is a very sacred and beautiful. You know, my uh, grandchildren, some of them, I got lots of grandchildren, but they were born in Wainai Valley on a farm. Mm. So they see animals. Right. They understand the cycle. Yeah. So for them, it's a little different. But for, uh, for people who don't grow up with animals and the this, this cycle of life, this is not something that they understand. Right. They're, right. You're right. They're just scared. I, oh, my goodness. And then we see all the horror stories on the, um, what do you call it, the television. Yes. And nobody mm -hmm. gets to die peacefully uh, at home, surrounded by the beauty and the families. Right. I would say peacefully and gracefully. It would yeah. be lovely if we can introduce more of that into this whole conversation. Well, I want to do that. Yeah. So we need to we need to move out of the realm of this quote where now I hate to bash anybody's religion especially my own however the Catholics are into martyrdom it's the whole religion from the beginning for mm. 2,000 years mm. it's been about martyrdom mm. and the suffering mm -hmm. all the saints mm -hmm. were su suffered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how do we move past martyrdom and suffering into a, a, the beauty well, of moving from this life to the next. So, Marsha, we'd have to do a five-hour series <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> so I would say, though, uh, I, I think, first of all, rather than look at the big picture of that, because that's, that's like a monumental thing. It is. It is. But if, if people could begin to, in their own lives, look at where are they. So, for example, for myself, 
when my mother passed away in the 80s, in, in the late uh, 80s, uh, it was the first significant death in my family, I would say. And for we were prepared medically, let's say. Uh, there was a lot of information about her condition. She was diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a very common and frequent thing many families now have yes. to uh, Every, deal with. Yep. And, of course, the news was still very um, startling and difficult to absorb and accept. Now, even though hospice was available, it was still not what I would call a family household um, you know, name, word. Right. So there, were, there was very little around in terms of support to help us interpret and understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, emotionally, you know, medically, again, we had lots of information, but for the families to understand the relationships and, and what to anticipate in the next several days or weeks to come. So um, I'm going to just say it was a very difficult time, you know, for us to deal with the reality of my mother being diagnosed. And even though we tend to relate to the medical field as having all the answers and all the solutions, they were unfortunately unable to do very much for her. We have to go to break. Okay. And we will be back. And I want to hear more about your mother okay. and your father and their passing. Right. And let's, let's just go to break and then we can talk more. Sure. Okay. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likeable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. And we're back. Yeah. Jade. For those of you that tuned in in the middle of the show, which this is my dear friend, Jade Young, and she is a hospice chaplain yes. and educator. Yes. And you do something else with, with seniors also. Oh, well, I also do a lot around the topic of aging and how can we age in a conscious and mindful manner so that rather than aging being just a decline and something to be avoided, uh, that we can maybe it's it's actually a new adventure you know and that this part of life too can open up some new opportunities for us mm -hmm. and that there's always ongoing growth and development no matter what age we are so is this conversation included in that yes I would say I, I would say and 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 maybe let me just um, Fast forward a bit and talk about the education part of it, right. Marcia, because I think for many people, by the time if a loved one or even yourself, if you've been diagnosed with a particular serious condition and you realize that maybe your options are limited or the doctor now has said you have limited time and, you know, the, the whole conversation about getting your affairs in order and, you know, people are then put into a state of panic right. and emotional distress. Well, that's a very difficult time, at, you know, to think more rationally and in a grounded fashion. So much of my work is, as much as I can, is to do what I call upstream education. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to really just understand is that we all have seasons of life. Right. You know, just as there's spring, there's the summer of life, there's the fall, and then there's winter. Okay. And uh, that nature has its natural cycle of, you know, the, the rebirth, the birthing process in spring, the flourishing in the summer, the maybe gradual decline uh, in, in the fall, and then winter. And just as we human beings have a very similar kind of life process, but each of them has its own, what I call, beauty and wisdom and power. But again, we're not taught that, either in schools or in life. Yeah. And so, again, just 
um, if we could have more of these conversations, I'm going to say, just out in the public or in our schools or our churches, our faith communities are also great places where people can come together. Well, I really want that to happen because I think when the doctor says get your affairs in order, that's a panic mode. Yeah. That's a button pusher. Right. So if we could have this conversation or get rid of that phrase, if the doctors could just get rid of that phrase, get your, yourself in order, you know, like, well, wait a minute, yeah. you know. Uh, so maybe we should the, the back unspoken up. unspoken in that yes. is that you're about to, to die, die at some point, mm -hmm. which is what the doctors have difficulty often in saying, and the patient is not quite prepared to hear that right. either. So we need to work on the languaging, as you know. Yes. yes, and I think we need to work on even conversations that help to normalize that this is a normal process of life, not to be feared or avoided. Well, with my sense of adventure, I'm sure there's something over there, something yeah. out there, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, we're still waiting for a memo yes. as to what it's what like. What it is, yes. <laughs> nobody, all my friends I know, nobody's come back to tell me. Yeah. 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 But I, I'm certain that there is. And so I don't have any fear. And watching my mother pass was so beautiful yeah. that I thought, oh, this is wonderful. There was no, no emotional upset. You know, yeah, there's the tears because you miss a person. Sure. But you miss a person when they move to California. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, so I'm just thrilled, thrilled at the opportunity, at the prospect of that maybe uh, we can move this conversation out into the bigger world yeah. so that people understand the choices that they have, that they can make the choice, yeah. that the choice is theirs. Is theirs, yes. right. Um, I might want to mention that, talk about bringing it out into the greater public yeah. uh, um, arena. Uh, there are two really amazing books that have been written recently. Uh, one was on the best sellers list, the New York best sellers list. Um, when air, bec when breath becomes air, written by a doctor himself who was diagnosed at the height of his own career of being trained as an internist, and then finding out that he had lung cancer, that all these back pains and everything wasn't just hard work and you know mm -hmm. not enough sleep, but it was really a very serious condition. And that he and his wife, who was also a medical doctor, had to face into all the questions that their patients had to face into. And it was only then that he really began to see from the inside out what it was like, this reality that patients are thrown into. Um, the other book is called Being Mortal. So I'm just going to use those two as examples where those are the kinds of things, again, written by a medical doctor, and PBS has made a wonderful documentary. I saw that when yes. that was wonderful, yeah. being mortal, yes. So it raises, I mean, those are great, what I call educational tools. A church could show this to their group. A rotary club could show it. It begins the conversation. It gives someone, people, uh, uh, topics to, you know, generate questions about, concerns about. And one of the things that I liked about being mortal was when he he had to confront well we're taught to do no harm and then we keep doing things medical things medical procedures that are doing harm yes yes and he had yes. to face at what point do i back off of that right at what point do i tell me enough and and those are tough questions at what point does an invasive procedure really become much more harmful to the patient? You know, where do we draw the line? And, and how do we even arrive at that choice? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a conversation that the patient needs to have with the, with the doctor and the family? The family, yes. Because again, the family is really impacted by all of this. My daughter is a hospice nurse, and she tells the stories about everything is going fine, and then some family member comes in upset that you're not doing this for mama and you're not doing that and then everything goes haywire. Do you see that? Frequently, actually, frequently. 
um, someone who hasn't been in touch with the family or is living on the mainland or simply has a different maybe a set of religious values and right. beliefs mm -hmm. which are different from the patient and the rest of the family so if anything uh, by the time the conflict has arisen though I'll I'm almost guaranteed that this conflict has surfaced before right but they've never really had the time or, or desire to address it so uh, by now though it just becomes I would say one of those opportunities for great courage on everyone's part and an opportunity for great healing and reconciliation mm -hmm. but it takes a commitment on everyone's part to kind of move through some of the differences it's okay to have differences but how can we still work together for the well-being again focusing on the needs of the patient and and remembering I, get, I think we have to remember that it is the patient's choice. It yeah. is not ours. Yeah. We can't choose for the patient. Right. The patient has to choose. And the patient should choose early, like now, when I'm healthy. Yes. When I, without the emotional upset. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, without all the emotional filters and the sense of panic and, and the stress. And, you know, to be able to think in a manner where you're able to look at all the options and really ask yourself what would be the most appropriate for you what would be the most even nurturing and comfortable for you right you know given your values and your personality yes I think that well this is the beginning yes, <laughs> this, it is, is, this, this it is, is a really, really is. good start we want to say just a few words here that I, I don't want people to think that this is an either or mm -hmm. if you are belong to a religion, that you chose to belong to this religion, and they say that, that you don't have this choice, then that's what you do. You do whatever, because you chose that religion, you should choose to follow their dictates. However, their religion should not dictate how you enter the end of life. And I think that's, that's the thing we have to get clear on. We have to really get clear that it's okay to follow your religion. It's not okay to have your religion impose on me. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that is one of those issues that we have to get really clear about. And you have to think, well, now, if I'm going to a castle hospital mm -hmm. where that is a religious hospital, obviously the choices are different. So we have to begin to think, think clearly on what we're doing. And that, again, is that conversation we have to have early in life. Yes, again, earlier the better, mm -hmm. the more proactive the better, the more upstream the better. And the more information, I think, it's important to have, you know, so you do understand what your options are. I love that up, upstream. I yeah. love that phrase. Yeah. Well, you know, and if you talk about like the water, the source of water, the more upstream you get generally, the clearer, Correct. the more pure the water is. That by the time it gets downstream, it may have picked up debris. Right. It may have picked up, you know, pollution along the way. So, um, yeah, I just think, again, it's really to the benefit of that individual and the family again. I want to really be sure that we include all the members, at least the significant members, um, because their lives will be impacted just as mine was with my mother. Right. You know, her well-being and knowing, anticipating that she would be gone was, you know, an emotional shock to the mm -hmm. system. So we all have to learn to deal with that. But I will say, I want to just add this one piece, that sometimes there are so many hidden gifts in all of this, Marcia, on a personal level to learn about something called compassion. We don't talk about that much at all in our culture. Or spiritual well-being. But these are huge, huge topics. And so important, I think, to our overall, how we live, mm -hmm. how we live on the planet, how we treat each other. Yeah, and we're back to, to all of these traditions and religions, because in all of them, yeah. that is, it is paramount, is how we treat each other. You know, and one of the Ten Commandments is caring for your neighbor. Yeah. You know, loving thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. And so 
we have to compassion i love that we have to begin to think and in, in allowing your family member your patient with compassion to make choices that that's to me that's a real nugget here that you're right we don't say it we really need to allow and by allowing that is the compassion allowing people to make their choices and God, I love you. <laughs> we have been together through so much, and I expect that we'll keep going in this direction because I do want this conversation to move out into the yes. broader. We, we've got to do this. Well, I'm glad to have been a part of this, Marsha, and um, I'm just honored to be here. Well, and we will look forward to now stay tuned because we are going to have, we're going to move out into the world. We're going to have this conversation at a broader Place. Thank you, Jade. It's a pleasure being with you as always. Aloha. 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 <laughs>